gone before in that fair homeland we'll know no parting beyond the sunset forevermore let's pray our heavenly father we just thank you for that promise of where we'll meet you beyond the sunset, across the river, the great Jordan River. We just thank you for that promise that you've given us and for our, for our future uh, friends and family as well. We just thank you for that. Lord, we ask you as we go into this time of prayer that we, we ask you that you would touch each and every one of the hearts that are out here in the congregation today. Lord, we thank you for your love and your concern for us. We thank you, Lord, that you would look down upon those that we have on our list of sick. We just ask you, Lord, that you would suit a blessing to each and every one of these. Lord, we just thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and these things we pray. reminded us about how it was Valentine's Day and of course in doing so made the application that the greatest act of love was in fact when Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross for us. Valentine's Day is interesting and of course today that's no longer the case. I'm guessing that while last week you may have had a card to give to a loved one or maybe some balloons or flowers or maybe you had breakfast in bed, or maybe you went out on a date, that today, as good as it gets, might be a trip to Home Depot. But what's interesting is that with God's love, it doesn't change. We're reminded in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So while today is no longer Valentine's Day, I assure you that we have good reason to remember 
and we have good reason to share, and we certainly have good reason to celebrate. Because even today, Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross is the greatest act of love ever given. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the time that we can come around your table and that we're reminded of your body and the bread that we take and that we're reminded of your blood that was poured out for us and the juice that we drink. God, in that simple act that comes without flowers, without balloons, without cards, it is a reminder of the greatest act of love that you would come and take our place and take our punishment and die in our stead. Forgive us, Lord, for our sins and direct us in a path of righteousness that we may become more like you each day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Thank you for letting us be a part of your lives as we come into your living room or wherever you are today. And we, we're glad to be able to share God's word with you and we're glad that you've invited us to do so. Now, we've been talking about since the first of the year, fear. There's a lot of fear in our world and I think that's pretty obvious. But you know, the, one of the things we've talked about is that a lot of these fears really will dissipate when you get a greater fear. A greater fear, and the greater fear, of course, is the fear of the Lord. And when you get that greater fear, when you understand who God is and who you are and what God wants for your life, then you'll get that greater fear. And when you do so, then fear of man, fear, fear of many things in this world will dissipate. As a matter of fact, we talked about the fear of man and how that can affect us in many ways and cause us even to, uh, to compromise our values, to compromise our morals, and not to be who we really ought to be for the Lord. And as a result, then, we talked about the fact that Isaiah chapter 51 says that why should I fear man when you made the heavens? Why should we fear man when God made the heavens? In other words, the greater fear. Why are we fearing man when God is the one that's really in control? And so one of the fears that we talked about dissipating or how to deal with was a fear of man. But today I want to talk to you about another fear that we all seem to have on many occasions and, and sometimes, you know, quite, quite often is a fear of the future. The fear of the future. Now, I believe we fear the future a lot of times because we don't have control of it. And we don't like what we cannot control. Reminds me of a group of ladies. They were going on vacation, decided to go to London, England. And so here they are in London, England. They got on one of those double-decker buses for a tour throughout the city. They thought this is going to be great. Some of them got to stay on the bottom on the first level, but the others had to go on top. A couple of them had to go on top. And so they went on through the tour, and everything went, went really, really well. And when they got off, and the ones that were on the bottom were talking about how great the tour was. They said it was absolutely fantastic. I mean, it was just what we dreamed of, going through and seeing all the sights of London, and the tour guide was so good, and everything was just so special. It was so great. We had a great time. And the other said, well, we didn't. I said, well, what do you mean you didn't? I said, well, we didn't like it at all. Well, why not? Everything was good. Everything was great. I said, sure, it was for you. You had a driver. Friends, we don't like what we can't control. And so a lot of times fear comes into our lives, especially fear of the future. When we see things and we start imagining what could possibly happen, we start having those kind of fears. That's what I read about in 2 Kings 2 Kings, there was a man who had that kind of fear. 
He was a servant of the prophet Elisha. Listen to what it says beginning in verse 8 of chapter 6, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8. Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going to be there or going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and time again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, Will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet, who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so that I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He is in Dotham. He sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went there by night and surrounded the city. When a servant of a man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and looked, and the hills were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. The servant had a fear of what those people were going to do, of what could happen with all those horses and chariots around. But then Elisha let him see the future, let him see what was actually there, and let him know that the future was safe. Let's bow. Father, I thank you so much for your word, your word that comforts us, your word that teaches us. May it teach us today about how we should look upon the future, how we should let this fear of the future dissipate in perspective to our fear of you. Father, our fear for you, our fear and yet also our knowledge of knowing who you are and how much you love us. Father, Please help us today to understand your word. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. One of Satan's greatest prisons that he puts us in, I believe, is a fear, and the fear of the future. The fear where we can't control things. The fear of the future. The fear of the unknown, if you will. Now, there are two philosophers that had a lot to say on this subject. Or, well, actually, they had something to say on this subject, I should say. First of all, one of the greatest philosophers that ever lived, King Solomon the wisest man, uh, the wisest king in the Old Testament. And here's what he says in chapter in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 7. Since no man knows the future, who can tell him what is to come? Now that sounds kind of simplistic, but a lot of the Proverbs, a lot of the sayings of Solomon were because sometimes philosophy can be pretty simplistic. But since no one knows the future, who can tell him what is to come? In other words, guess what? The future doesn't belong to you or to no one upon this earth. No one can tell you what is coming. No one can do so. And that's what you need to understand about the future. But then also, there's another great philosopher who talked about the future. His name was Yogi Berra. He was a great Hall of Fame catcher uh, for baseball. And here is what Yogi Berra said about the future. The future, it ain't what it used to be. The future, it ain't what it used to be. Now that has to be either the most profound statement I have ever heard, or it's the absolute most idiotic thing I've ever heard. I haven't figured it out, but here's the thing. The future doesn't belong to us. It only belongs to God. And that's what we need to understand. It is God, it is in God's hand. And God, when he talks, when he shows the future, when he, when he talks about, or when he, um, his will toward the future, is not for you and I to have a perfect life, a complete life, a tr tremendously peaceful life. That's not it. Jesus told his disciples that you're going to be going and you're going to be doing this mission. And when you're doing this mission, people are going to hurt you. They're going to harm you. People are going to say things against you. They're going to hate you. And some of them might even kill you or, th or throw you in prison. And all these things that he said that's going to happen to them. You see, God could have said when you were saved, when you became a Christian, hey, now I'm just going to make life easy for you. 
We're just going to make it a bed of roses. No problem whatsoever. But instead, God reminds us there's going to be thorns. There's going to be problems. There's going to be trouble. Because I want you to grow. If it was a bed of roses, if everything was perfect, if everything was peace, if everything was just exactly smooth, then you couldn't grow. But now I want you to grow toward your faith in me and trust me even more. So yes, those things are going to happen. But here's what you can know. I will be with you in your future. I'm the one who holds the future and I will be with you in your future. And so we struggle with our fear of the future, don't we? Why do we struggle with the fear of the future so much? I believe, first of all, because we're worriers. We're worriers. And worry and fear go hand in hand, do they not? They go hand in hand. Someone said that worry is an attempt for us to try to live in the future so that we can control it. So that we can control what's going on in our own future. But we know that that can't happen. It was back in 1991 when Saddam Hussein had made this great threat. And that was if the Allies come into Kuwait, if they invade Kuwait, then he will launch his Scud missiles against Israel. Well, the Allies did, and so did Saddam Hussein. Now, the great fear was that there were going to be chemical and biological weapons inside those missiles. So to prepare for that, the Israeli government had passed out gas masks, and there were gas masks among your citizens. And they had syringes with some kind of serum in them to, uh, to, to hopefully take care of any kind of biological or chemical warfare that Saddam Hussein would bring against Israel. And so the first missile was launched, and the first missile came, and it exploded. But there was no biological weapon. There was no chemical weapon. Instead, it was just an explosion. Now, it killed a few people. But then they found out soon that with, uh, with missile after missile after missile, that there was no biological or chemical weapon that hit Israel. Now, it's interesting because people found out that actually more people died before the first missile launch than died during the missile launches. After those 17 att attacks, more people died before than after. What did they die of? Heart attack, stroke. Why? Because fear of the future. The fear of the future was too great for them. It was too much for them. And, you know, it, it was irrational, but yet that's what happened. But that's what the fear of the future is. It's irrational. That's what Jesus tells us. Jesus um, lets us know that, you know, when we live in, in that type of situation, you know what we're really doing, friends? When we live and we fear the future, what we're doing is we're living like practical atheists. We're living like either we don't believe that God really exists, or if he exists, but he doesn't have power, or if he has power and he exists, but he doesn't really care about us enough to take care of our future. He doesn't love us. And so we live like practical atheists in those situations. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 27, Jesus said, Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour up to his life? In other words, it's nonsense. Why are you worrying? It doesn't do you any good whatsoever. Here's what you need to know. You don't own the future, and you cannot control it. It is not yours, and you cannot control it. Only God can. Tomorrow doesn't recognize you as its master. It only recognizes Jesus. So are you a worrier? Then you need, and that's why one of the reasons that you fear the future. Another reason we fear the future is what we are wonders. Wonders. Let me explain that to you with a story from the Old Testament that we've been using a lot. And that's a story about the spies. When they go into the promised land, the children of Israel come up to the, uh, to the cusp of going over into the promised land. Moses sends the spies over. They come back. Ten have a bad report saying there are giants in the land. It's fortified. They're, we cannot take it. Two said, let's do it. We can do it with God's help. The ten went out and they went over the entire tribe or the entire uh, group of the Israelis. And as a result, they don't go in. They don't go in. Well, what was God's response to that? Take a look at it in Numbers chapter 14 and beginning with verse 26. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things I heard you say. In this desert, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counted in the census and who has grumbled against me, not one of you 
will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land you have rejected. But you, your bodies will fall in this desert. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your bodies lies in the desert. For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is to have me against you. I of the Lord have spoken. And I will surely do these things to the whole wicked community which is banded together against me. They will meet their end in the desert. Here they will die. In a sense, God was saying, since you didn't trust me enough to take a foot forward, since you didn't trust me enough to step into the promised land, to do what I asked you to do, since you didn't trust me enough to go up against the giants, to go up against the fortified cities, to go against the issues that would have been there, since you didn't trust me enough, then I'm going to let you sit where you are. I'm going to let you just wander around. Wander around in circles. Wander around in circles until every one of you that didn't trust me are dead. And then I'll raise up a new generation to trust me. You see, people are stuck where they were because they were afraid. And isn't that how we are? We get stuck where we are because we're afraid of commitment. And so we end up wandering rather than taking a step forward for God. We end up, we end up in a status quo instead of moving forward because we're too afraid to trust God to move forward. A Persian general back several years ago de dealt with criminals by putting them on a firing line. And while he, that was no, nothing it was really that strange, something that was done commonly, he put them on a firing line, but he would give them an option. There was a big black door that was there, and he would tell the criminals, he said, you can either take the firing line or be at the firing line, or you can go through and take what's coming behind that big black door. Well, they, most of them would choose the firing line. One day an aide asked him, he said, General, he said, what in the world is behind that ominous looking big black door? And the general said, freedom, but few are brave enough to choose it. Sometimes we're not brave enough to go through the door that God wants us to go. But when we do, we find freedom, we find blessings, we find joy that we cannot possibly imagine otherwise. Trusting God is the only way to really go into the future. So how do we do that? How do we faith our future? Because most of the time, you know what we do? We look at our future faithlessly, faithlessly. But instead, we need to faith our future. How do we do so? First of all, look to the past for assurance. Look to your past for assurance. You know, God has a track record, and it's pretty doggone good. God has a great track record, actually. He's not only creator of this entire world, but he's also sovereign over the entire world. And not only is he creator and sovereign over the world, but he's also sustainer. He's sustainer. He takes care of the world. Jesus reminds us in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 26, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? Look, see the lilies of the field grow. See how they grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you of, you of little faith? Jesus is saying, God has a track record. Open your eyes. God has a track record, track record when it comes to creation. Open your eyes. Did the sun come up this morning? Sure it did. It will, it will one day come when spring will start coming and the leaves will start coming back out on the trees and, and the grass will start growing and, and, the, and the vegetables will start growing and the flowers will start blooming? Sure they will. When you look up in the sky tonight, will the stars stay where they are? Will they not fall from the sky? Sure they will. Will the, moon, will the moon stay where it is will in an orbit? Will the world and all the planets stay in orbit? Sure they will. Why? Because God sustains them. 
Why do you think that if God keeps doing that day after day after day after day, that he won't be there for you tomorrow? That he won't be there for you tomorrow? And yet we do. But also, not only do we see that God has a track record in creation, but God has a track record in our salvation. Think about what God has already done for you in salvation. Romans chapter 8 and verse 2, or 32, says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? What kind of faith, friends, says, I believe that God sent his son to die on a cross and to suffer for my sins and to raise from the dead, to be buried and to raise from the dead, but I don't believe he's going to take care of me tomorrow. I don't believe he's going to take care of me in the future. What kind of faith is that? You see, there's only, there's, that's one of the reasons we come together on Sundays. We meet on the Lord's day and we meet around his table. That's a reason we take that little piece of bread and we take it into our mouth to remind us that Jesus gave his body for us. And we take a little bit of juice and we drink it to remind us that Jesus gave his blood for us. And Paul says, how often should we do that? I mean, how long should we do that? And we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's a reminder. It reminds us. It gives us you know, the idea that God has a track record. He's already provided Jesus for us for our salvation. Won't he take care of our future as well? Certainly he will. Bill and, Ga and Gloria Gaither um, had a, a two daughters years ago. And they decided that they wanted to have another child. And so they started asking the Lord and they started trying to get pregnant. And sure enough, they got pregnant. And here's what happened, though. They started thinking about who were we to bring a child into this world? Because their world, they said, was in turmoil. And indeed it was. It was at a time when Vietnam War was at its apex and people were complaining and, prost and, and um, protesting and all the other things they were doing against it. Campuses had shootings and things that were going on, rioting going on, and the world, I mean, our nation was in turmoil over that. Add to that, but their drug scene was growing and growing and growing, and the idea of free love was growing and growing and growing. And along with all that, the theology or the lack of theology and the movement that said God is dead. God is dead. He's no longer existing. And so all these things were going on, and they were asking themselves a question. Why would we want to bring a child into this world? Why would we want to do that to a child? Why would we want to bring a child into this mess that we're in? But then as the days got closer for their little one to be born, they started thinking, you know, God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't do things by accident. If this is his will, this child will be born and he'll take care of this child. Sure enough, Benji was born. Little Benji was born. And as a result of their thinking of what they and their prayers, they wrote this song. And a second verse, they wrote a song. And the second verse of a song says this. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy within. But better still this calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives, because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know And life is worth the living just because he lives. We can face the future with faith when we look back to the past with assurance. God has a great track record. Use it to build your faith. But also, if you want to face the future, don't just look to the past for assurance, but also live in the present with confidence. Live in the present with confidence. You know, worry is a thief. 
It robs us of a joy that we can have. And the problem is, we're worried about the probabilities of tomorrow rather than enjoying the probabilities of today. Jesus had something to say about that. In, J in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 34, he said, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I heard a preacher that told about when he, one of the greatest uh, pieces of advice he ever got. An older preacher took him out to dinner. And he was talking to him about his plans. Tell me, what are your plans for the future? What, what do you see? Where do you see yourself with God's eyes? And he says, well, I plan on being in this place. And I plan on doing this. And I want God to do great things for me. And the man ended up telling him, he said, son, he said, let me tell you something. He said, hold on to your dreams. Hold on to your dreams. They're special and they mean a lot. But let me tell you, don't value where you aren't. Where you're not yet. Value where you are now. Value where you are right now. In other words, live in the present. Enjoy the present. The Apostle Paul had something to say about that. I think he would agree. In Philippians chapter 4, and beginning with verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. By the way, the only way you can rejoice in the Lord always is for it to be in the Lord. That's the only way you can rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always. I would say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Rejoice in the Lord always. How can I do that, Paul? Well, remember, the Lord is near. The Lord is near. What's that mean? It means He's coming back. He's coming back. That's a guarantee. Jesus is coming back. Things are going to be made right. So you can rejoice in the Lord always. What about my circumstances, Paul? Oh, you can, you can live through those circumstances. Well, what about cancer, Paul? You can rejoice even in the midst of cancer. What about bankruptcy? You can rejoice even in the midst of bankruptcy. What about loss of, of family members? You can rejoice even in the loss of family members knowing that I am coming back and you'll see them again. Everything is being made right. You see... Jesus said, or God is telling us that these things, our circumstances, death, cancer, COVID, and whatever it is, it doesn't get the last word on our life. Jesus does. Jesus does. And the result is that the peace that passes all understanding will guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. You see, that's that peace. That's that perfect peace. That's that peace that I've experienced Peace that I've experienced around a bedside of a saint getting ready to pass on to meet Jesus. I remember a time when one of those saints told me, you know, cancer can put me down, but it cannot get me down because I'm trusting in Jesus to take me home. Cancer can get me and can get, get me down or put me down, but it cannot get me down. You know, someone said that anxious Christians are a contradiction of terms. It's a contradiction of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So lean, or uh, trust, live your, your, in the present with confidence. And look at your past. Look at God's track record for assurance that he'll be with you. And you can faith your future. And another way that you faith your future is lean into the future with obedience. Lean into your future with obedience. Men of, and women of faith have settled a lot of times for the status quo. But that's not where God wants us to be. He wants us to go forward, to go forward. Abraham was told by God, I want you to take your son Isaac. I want you to take him up to the mountain. I want you to sacrifice him to me. And Abraham immediately obeyed God and did exactly as God said. And he would have even sacrificed his own son to God but God stopped him. God stopped him. Now, how could Abraham do that? How could he possibly take the only son, the son of promise, the one through whom all his ancestors were supposed to come, or his descendants were supposed to come, how could he take him and actually sacrifice him? Well, the book of Hebrews tells us how. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 17, it says, by faith. That's how. By faith. Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. 
Even though God has said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. You see, that's where your future is, I, uh, uh, Abraham. It's through Isaac. That's where your future is coming, I, um, Abraham. It is through your son. But now he says, take that future and I want you to sacrifice him. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he didn't receive Isaac back from the dead. You see what he was doing? He was trusting God with his future. He was trusting God with his future. Let me ask you, did Abraham threaten his future when he obeyed God? No. What did he do? He sealed his future. He guaranteed his future. And when you and I trust God with our future, that's what we do as well. We don't threaten our future. We guarantee our future. But we've got to take that step forward. Years ago, I used to love watching on Saturday afternoons, Wide World of Sports. I don't know how many of you ever saw that, but one of the things that just stays in my mind, even to this day, is the phrase that they would use as they started, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Now, I can't tell you what video went along with the thrill of victory. I do not remember that, but I can remember to this day the one that goes along with the agony of defeat. And that was when a man was coming down a ski jump. He was coming down a ramp, and something happened where he slipped off the ramp, and he went across even a building, and he would not make that jump. The agony of defeat. Ski jumping. That was one of the things I loved watching on the world of sports. I mean, I would just love watching it over and over and over again to see them come off that ramp and go way up into the sky. And you know what I was told and how they, how they were able to go so far? In order to go the furthest, what they had to do was lean way over the front of their skis. To lean way over the front of their skis. Now, I'm not a skier, and I'm not going to get on a ramp like that. But I can tell you, if something ever happened and I was in that situation, I think the last thing that I would be trying to do is a lean over top, is a lean forward that would seem the most dangerous to me. I would be hesitant to lean forward. And oftentimes in life, I'm hesitant to lean forward. Even when God says, here's an open door, I'm hesitant to lean forward. You see, I just want to sit back sometimes and I just want to let things happen the way that they're happening. And I just want things to just go on like they've always gone on around me instead of leaning forward. But to please God, in order to grow with God, in order to be who God wants us to be, we have to lean forward and obey Him. We have to lean forward and obey Him in obedience and, and, and taking a risk, it may seem, at those times. Remember that group of the Israelites that I was telling you about in the very beginning of a message. The ones we've been talking about that were in the wilderness and they were walking around or they were going around and traveling around for 40 years in that wilderness until everyone that was 20 years of age or older died except for Joshua and Caleb. And remember what God said, I'm gonna raise up this new generation and he did. And then he took that new generation, he said, now it's your turn. You're gonna go into the promised land. I'm gonna give you the land that I offered to give to your, your parents. They wouldn't take it. What about you, you gonna take it? And so they would march. They listened to God and they were marching. But then to get over to the promised land, what they would have to do is go across the Jordan River. But the Jordan River was a flood stage. It was harvest time. So you can imagine this roaring river, this river with a tremendous current sweeping away tree and debris and everything in its path and going in a flood stage. And so here they were. And so the Israelites, what did God say? Okay, you march toward the river. You march toward the river. Now remember when God opened up the Red Sea, how did he do that? He had a wind that blew all night long and it parted the sea all night long and it put dry land between them. So the Israelites, when they came to it, it was already parted and they could see what they could walk through. Well, that was different for this group. For this group, they were walking along. They would be a thousand yards away from the river and it was still raging. They would be 500 yards away from the river and it was still raging. The priests who were carrying the Ark of Covenant, who were to be the first ones to go into the river, would be walking and walking and walking. 100 yards away, it's still raging. Five yards away, it's still raging. One yard away, it's still raging. Listen to what it says in Numbers chapter 13 and verse 14. 
says, now the Jordan, in verse 15 actually, the latter part, yet as soon as a priest carried the ark, reached the Jordan, and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathon. And while the water was flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, that is the Salt Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jordan, or Jericho, and the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. It wasn't until their feet hit the water that it parted, that this raging river obeyed God and parted. It wasn't until their feet hit the water. You see, sometimes to get where God wants us to be, our feet got to get wet. We've got to get our feet in the water. We've got to take that first step forward. We've got to do what God wants us to do. Now, for some of you, God is asking you to take that step forward. He's been asking you, when are you going to give your life to me? Will you realize that you're in your sin? You realize that my son Jesus died for you? You realize all these things, so when are you going to respond? When are you going to say that I'm ready to surrender my life to Jesus Christ? I'm ready to be baptized, to have my sins washed away, and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm ready to have all those things happen in my life. Get your feet wet. Take a step forward. Or maybe you're already a Christian, you're a immersed believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and God's been calling on you for some service, to take some step forward in faith, to do something in faith that he's calling you to do. Maybe it's to go to a neighbor to share God's word with them. Maybe it's a family member to share God's word with them. Maybe it's some kind of ministry in the church to do something there. Or maybe it's a sin that he wants you to handle that you just haven't let go of yet. He wants you to trust him. And take a step in his direction. A lot of times we get stuck where we are because we're not willing to take that foot and put it forward to actually get that foot wet. It was in 1525. A cardiographer drew a map. And on the map he drew, he had an outline of what he believed was North America and how it would look. And so he drew this map. But then beyond North America, he drew... He didn't know what was out there. He didn't know what else existed. And so beyond that point, he had these words, there be dragons, there be monsters. That's what he would put, there be terrors. And so he would put this, put this on his map. Well, in the 1800s, a man by the name of John Franklin, an English explorer, got hold of that map. And so he took the map and then he started scratching out monsters, dragons, and terrors. And instead, he wrote the word God. There be God. He was saying in the unknown, God is there. You see, you will not fear the future, friends, if God is already there. You won't. You won't fear the future, future if God is already there. But you need to take a step and lean forward. To where he wants you to go. You need to live right now confidently that God is going to take care of you. You need to be able to take care of the need for looking to the past and receiving your assurance as you look forward, trusting God's track record. It was in the 1880s, D.L. Moody had a revival in Massachusetts. And a young man came forward during that revival. And a young man simply said, I'm just not sure what I should do. But I'm going to trust and obey God. I'm not sure what I should do, but I'm going to trust and obey God. Moody song leader Daniel Towns, Towner actually wrote down those words and he sent them to a friend of his, James Samus. James Samus put a poem to those words. Using those words, he made a poem out of it. He sent it back to Daniel Towner. And Daniel Towner wrote a song, and that song says this, Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Will you trust him? Will you obey him today? Corey Ten Boone said, 
Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Trust God today, friends. He'll take care of your future. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much knowing that even though the future is unknown to me, that the one who holds the future is known. Father, help me to trust you. Help me to be willing to get my feet wet. Help me to go forward. Father, those within the hearing of my voice right now, they need to take a step forward. I don't know what their next step needs to be. You show them, Father. Open their hearts to you and help them to make that next step. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you'd like to make that next step, give us a call here at Grassy Creek, 859-472-2241, or email us, flynngc at gmail.com, or you can respond to our Facebook page as well. Thank you again, and may God bless you as you learn to trust him. Fear the one. Fear, get the greatest fear, and the other fears will dissipate.